more people in here, but people I think are running late. Judy, did you want to go ahead and introduce our speaker for this evening? Sure enough. Um, I've never ever actually met Sam in person, but <laughs> last summer we were out at the Discovery Center and I met his parents. And they were very excited about Master Naturalists. And they said, well, just meetings or anything like that? And I said, well, yeah. And she's, oh, our son would be great <laughs> at doing that. So they gave me his number. And Sam has graciously agreed to um, talk to us tonight. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation at Virginia Tech. His research, research focuses on working with local, state, and federal partners to conserve bats in the eastern United States. His work includes studying the roost ecology of the endangered northern long-eared bat on Marine Corps Base Quantico and Prince William Forest Park in eastern Virginia, the nocturnal foraging habitat needs of bats in Virginia, the effects of wildland fires on bats in Florida, as well as developing and testing novel technology to increase detection of air bat species. Sam will talk about his journey into a world of bats, his research, and the tools he uses to study them, modern conservation threats, and how citizen scientists can help serve bats. And he comes highly recommended. <laughs> Welcome, Sam. Well, I appreciate that, Judy. Um, now, whoever is the host, can you uh, enable screen sharing, please? No, okay, there we go. I'll try to get my PowerPoint pulled up here. Let's see here. Okay. Can everybody see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right, thanks. And if it ever goes awry, just uh, give me a shout and I'll try to fix it. Yeah, Sam, uh, well, we're, the, you're, the view we're in is is not the slideshow view. Okay, yeah. Let's see, I'm dealing with multiple monitors here. So let me try a different option. Okay, and... There you go. How about that? Is. That's good. Okay, perfect. All right, well, thanks, Judy, for that introduction. And uh, thanks for everybody uh, for inviting me to come speak to you about my, my favorite topic. It's, uh, it's easy for me to talk about bats. Um, uh, a little bit about what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, I'll start with kind of my journey into the world of bats, because uh, it's it's certainly a, a unique uh, way to make a living. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what makes bats unique among mammals, because um, they're, they're just such cool creatures. Uh, I'll talk about the bats we have here in Virginia. Um, Unfortunately, we always have to talk about uh, the conservation threats facing bats because uh, there are, are bats here in Virginia and, and really the world in, in general are uh, in trouble. Um, and then I'll spend most of my talk uh, talking about my research uh, and all the various unique methods that we use to study bats because they're, uh, they're, they're really kind of cryptic and, and difficult creatures to study compared to a lot of wildlife species. Uh, and then we'll end with uh, some of the ways that I think um, you all, the Virginia Master Naturalists, uh, can help. Um, I really wasn't super familiar with your organization until I, Judy reached out to me, but it, it seems really cool and it uh, seems like you guys have uh, wide reaching influence. Um, and so I think there's some ways that you all can really help. Uh, so I've been involved in bats actually for, for quite a long time. Um, I got, got my starts in, in uh, bats uh, all the way back in middle school, actually, uh, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, I, I started out uh, as a junior curator at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh, North Carolina, which if you've never been to that museum, it is absolutely worth the trip down there. Um, it's a world-class museum that takes up almost two city blocks, um, really an incredible place. Uh, but they have a, a youth program uh, called the Junior Curators um, that I, I started off in eighth grade, and it goes all the way through 12th grade. Um, and essentially, we we do a ton of stuff. It's it's really a pretty intensive program for young people. Um, we take care of all the animals and exhibits at the museum uh, once a week. Uh, we have speakers uh, from various different uh 
professions in the natural resources come speak to us. Um, we're expected to do a lot of education, both in the museum um, and actually taking program animals out to local schools and parks and doing programs uh, kind of similar to what the master naturalists do. Um, and then we're also uh, embedded with researchers at the museum. Uh, and so the, and we essentially serve as uh, field technicians for them while they're doing their research. Uh, and the lady that I got paired up with uh, is the mammal collections manager, uh, Lisa Gatins, a wonderful lady. And uh, she is a bat specialist. Uh, and so the first time she took, you know, little middle school Sam out bat netting uh, way past my bedtime. And I got to actually uh, see these, you know, mysterious little gremlins of the night uh, up close that people just don't typically think about uh, because we, we don't don't see them in our everyday life. Um, I just thought that was so cool. And I was hooked. Uh, and I, I knew that I, I wanted to do something with bats uh, for my career. Um, and I've been lucky enough to uh, continue on that path, and, and I'm still involved in, in bat work. Um, fast forward to uh, college, I, I went to NC State, got a degree in fish and wildlife uh, biology, um, and I, among a ton of amazing experiences I had there and internships, uh, one of the coolest internships I did is I worked for uh, a summer for a joint Clemson and U.S. Forest Service research lab. Um, and they essentially sent me out, they gave me a bunch of gear and sent me out to the Obed Wild and Scenic River in Tennessee for a whole summer. Uh, and my job was to chase down uh, a fairly poorly understood bat called the Eastern Small-Footed Bat. Um, and it's it's the uh, smallest bat we have here in the uni United States um, and small, and we have them in here in Virginia. Um, their body size is only about half my thumb uh, and their wingspan is only about that. They're really tiny little, tiny little bats, um, and they're poorly understood because they uh, live uh, in really difficult places to access. Uh, they like to live in rock crevices on these sheer cliff faces, um, and so my my job was try to get a better understanding of uh, exactly where on these cliff lines they live and what kind of habitat they need and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I, I would go out and capture these bats at night and put little tracking units on them and try to figure out where they're roosting during the day. Um, we also deployed bat detectors, which I'll, I'll talk more about later, uh, that actually listen to their echolocation uh, to try to get a better idea of where they are uh, in the Obed Wild and Scenic River, uh, which is a national park property. Um, and I even went down into uh, old abandoned uh, hand dug coal mines uh, and deployed bat detectors in the mines uh, to try to see if they were using those. Uh, so that was a, a lot of fun and that got me a, a lot of great experience and marketable skills um, that then got me a job after college. Uh, and I worked as a bat biologist for uh, an environmental consulting firm, uh, which is a kind of another side of, of bats. Um, it's not all just uh, academic research, so to speak. Um, you know, there's a, a number of bat species that are uh, federally listed as threatened and endangered species. Uh, and if anybody wants to clear land for a development, like an oil pipeline, oil refinery, shopping mall, what, what have you, um, oftentimes they're required to do uh, an endangered species survey to make sure that their activities are not going to harm these rare species. Uh, and so those Companies uh, have to bring in an expert like me to, to survey their property and, and figure out if there's any rare species there and, and help them develop a plan to mitigate any impacts. Uh, so I did that for about a year and a half after college. Uh, and then I uh, always knew I wanted to go to grad school. Uh, so I connected with my boss, uh, Dr. Mark Ford here at Virginia Tech, uh, and he offered me a master's position uh, that we then uh, about a year later turned into a PhD. Um, and uh, started that about 2017, and I've been here ever since. Um, Virginia Tech is uh, is unique, uh, and, and my lab is unique uh, in that we're a, a federal and academia partnership. Uh, we're a USGS, U.S. Geological Survey, uh, cooperative fish and wildlife research unit. Um, and so my boss is actually a, a federal employee stationed here as a professor. Um, and Essentially, the USGS co-op units uh, exist to uh, provide uh, 
critical research and consulting services to uh, a wide range of local, state, and federal agency partners, uh, while at the same time training the next generation of scientists and wildlife managers. Um, so, I mean, we've we've done uh, tons of, uh, you know, in addition to my, my research that's going to get me a, a PhD eventually, um, I've gotten to participate in tons of other uh, side projects and consulting activities with a wide range of, of uh, other agency partners uh, like the Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Defense, um, even NASA. Um, so it's, it's been a really great experience. Um, so I'm going to just launch into quickly uh, what makes bats unique. Uh, these are slides I took from a uh, mammology, a, a lecture I give to the mammology class. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't go into as much detail as I would like to there because we have a short amount of time. But I did want to go through these just to give you an idea of, of what makes bats just so cool and so unique. Um, and the, the first and foremost one that comes to mind uh, is they're the only mammals that have powered flight. Um, there are other mammals uh, that are, are typically misnamed um, like flying squirrels and the colugo or the flying lemur, um, but they're, they're all gliders. Um, bats are the only ones that have evolved uh, true powered flight. Um, and they do that by um, their, they actually have all the same bones that we have in our arms and hands, uh, but their finger bones are greatly elongated. And then they have a, a skin web between those fingers uh, and that allows them to fly, and that's actually where the uh, name for the order uh, that all bats are in um, comes from, Chiroptera. Um, it means hand wing. Um, so that that's really cool, uh, and that's, that's allowed them to uh, be extremely successful. In fact, you can find uh, bats on every continent except Antarctica. Number two is they have uh, really sophisticated echolocation. Um, these are, uh, they're using frequencies in the ultrasound range that are above our hearing range. Um, humans can hear up to about 18 to 20 kilohertz. Um, and I, I don't know if any of you are uh, teachers who have ever experienced a misbehaving student using one of those apps that uh, plays an annoying tone that all the kids are like, oh, I'll turn it off. It's really loud. But uh, the the older teacher can't hear that. Um, it's It's essentially kind of that concept. Um, as we get uh, older, um, we, can, we can't we can hear quite as well on the, the upper range of our hearing. Um, and so young people can actually uh, hear certain species of bats echolocating if they get close enough, uh, because some bats, again, our, our hearing uh, at best when we're young goes up to about 20 kilohertz. And there are some bats that come down to about 18 kilohertz. And so there are some species that we can actually hear. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, this, this system is incredibly, uh, highly evolved, uh, and it allows them to essentially be sort of the, the stealth fighters of the animal kingdom. Um, you know, there's a, a common misconception, misconception that, uh, you know, blind as bats, you hear that saying all the time, or blind as a bat, but that's just so not true. Um, they actually, they have reasonably good eyesight, but especially when you, put in the echolocation, um, they're really good at navigating through the forest at night. Um, and they use this echolocation to locate insect prey um, with a really high degree of precision. Um, and there's a lot of research that's going into, you know, exactly how bats perceive their environment. Um, but as far as we can tell, they, they can hear uh, size, shape, distance, movement, um, and, and even the, the fine texture of objects. Um, just with sound in their ears, which I think is really uh, incredible. Uh, bats are predominantly nocturnal. Um, I say predominantly because there's some species in the tropics uh, that actually uh, are more active during the day, but all of our bats uh, here in the U.S. And, and here in Virginia are nocturnal. Um, and that's an adaptation to avoid predation and competition with birds um, and to take advantage of all the insects that are out at night. Uh, some bats hibernate, uh, and I say some because uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but uh, there are some bats that actually migrate uh, and live in trees year round to avoid hibernation, um, but quite a few of our bats here in Virginia hibernate, uh, which is an extreme reduction in the metabolic rate, heart rate, and respiratory rate of bats uh, that allows them to survive long periods of time without food. 
uh, and that that's an adaptation to our our winter um, here in the United States. Um, and and again, some bats avoid that by migrating south, and they'll they'll maybe only on a really cold day enter a short bout of hibernation that we call torpor. Uh, but that's a, something that's really unique to bats. Uh, they also exhibit an absolutely shockingly wide array of life strategies. Um, you know, in terms of, of feeding strategies, uh, behavior, reproduction strategies, and, and morphology, um, they have a greater degree of specialization than, than any other mammal group. Uh, and so that, that adaptability combined with powered flight and the ability to echolocate um, has helped bats to become an uh, incredibly successful uh, group of mammals and widely distributed. Again, they can be found on every continent except Antarctica. Um, and they're, they're essentially uh, as common as birds. Uh, they're everywhere all the time. Uh, we just don't see them because they come out at night and they're silent. They're like the stealth fighters of the animal kingdom. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, again, this is a this is fascinating because this is a creature that people just don't really think about and they don't have personal experience with often. Uh, but bats are incredibly important to us economically. Um, they provide really crucial ecosystem services to humans uh, and they they directly affect our, our bottom line. Um, in fact, here in the United States alone, bats are responsible for 3.1 billion. $3.1 billion in pest control services annually. Uh, so they're incredibly important to have around and to protect, and they directly affect our ability to go to the grocery store and have affordable food. So they're incredibly important. Um, now here in the US, um, we've got about 47 different species of bats uh, with most of that diversity uh, located kind of in the Southwestern US. Um, but there, there is uh, here in Virginia, um, following the Appalachian mountain chain, there's kind of another hot spot of bat diversity in the US. Uh, and that's because of all the cave systems that we have around here. Um, and just to contrast things, uh, there's, again, I said there's 47 different species in the US about, give or take, um, depending on how you count them. Uh, but there's about 1,400 species worldwide. Um, and I, I consulted on a, uh, a bat project uh, down in Colombia a couple of years ago. Uh, and I, I thought it was interesting, you know, Colombia is about the, the size of California and Texas combined. So not, not a small area, uh, but compared to the whole of the US, not that big. Um, in Colombia alone, uh, there's something like 217 different species of bats uh, compared to only about 47 in the whole of the US. So the, most of the diversity is, is kind of focused along the equator. Um, but again, we, we do have uh, decent diversity uh, here in Virginia um, because of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, so here in Virginia, uh, we have uh, 17 species that have been uh, recorded in the state. Um, they make up two different families. Um, Vespertilionidae is the largest family of bats in the world. And that's uh, what all but one of our bats are, are in that family. Uh, and that's a, a family of uh, generally small bodied, um, echolocating, insect eating bats. Um, and you know, going back to my point that bats exhibit a wide range of strategies. Um, you know, they eat uh, fruit, fish, other bats, mice, insects, uh, even blood. Uh, but here in Virginia um, and in the U.S., all of our bats are insect eaters. Um, so again, there's 17 different species. Um, oh, and then uh, the other family is Molossidae, uh, which has only one bat, and that's the uh, Brazilian free-tailed bat. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the uh, Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin, Texas, uh, that has all the bats come streaming out of it every night, um, that's that's that species, the Brazilian free-tailed bat, or you also hear it called the uh, Mexican free-tailed bat sometimes. Um, so again, we have 17 species, and they're roughly divided up into uh, two main groups. Uh, the, we call them the cave bats uh, and the migratory tree bats. Um, the cave bat, both groups uh, generally live in trees during the summertime, and that's where they have their babies up in the trees. Uh, can also be in bridges and culverts and people's attics, but, but for the most part, most of them are in trees. 
Um, and then during the wintertime, they go back to caves to hibernate uh, here in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, but there's also another group called the migratory tree bats that live in trees year round and they uh, migrate south to avoid having to go into those long periods of hibernation. Um, here in Virginia, uh, of our 17 species, four uh, are federally listed as an endangered species. Uh, the northern long-eared bat, which is my main study species, the Indiana bat, the gray bat, and the Virginia big-eared bat. Uh, and then three are also state endangered, but they're not federally listed yet. Uh, the Raffinesque's big-eared bat, the little brown bat, and the tricolored bat. So, um, you know, bats are uh, unfortunately in trouble uh, worldwide, but particularly here in the eastern U.S. Um, and the, the largest threat facing our bats here in Virginia uh, is a disease called white nose syndrome. Um, and it's, it's a fungal infection that infects them while they're hibernating. Uh, and it's called white nose syndrome because uh, we didn't know what was causing it uh, for a while. Uh, we discovered it first around 2006. Um, in a cave, the epicenter is a, a cave uh, up near Albany, New York, um, and it's characterized by uh, this white fungus that grows on the nose of bats, uh, or this white fuzzy stuff, and uh, we pretty quickly found out that it was a, a fungus, um, and it, it's essentially uh, like dying from a really bad case of athlete's foot all over your body while you're trying to sleep uh, over winter. Um, it, it wakes bats only go into hibernation with just enough fat reserves to get them through till the spring. And this fungus invades all of their soft tissues, uh, and it irritates them and wakes them up. And so they groom themselves, uh, more often than they should. And then they use up their fat reserves and die. Um, and this is just absolutely <clears throat> wiped out our bat populations here in the Eastern U S and in Virginia. Um, yeah. unfortunately, uh, the Northern long-eared bat are our latest estimates, um, which used to be one of the most common bats we had here in the state. Um, they've experienced close to a 95% decline in their population. Um, so this is a really serious disease. Um, un unfortunately, uh, we don't have, uh, any cures yet. There's, um, things that are under development, uh, but nothing has really shown promise yet. Um, and I'll show a, a slide in a minute uh, of uh, where white nose is right now. Um, but so that's that's the biggest threat. Um, and that has spurred uh, a lot of federal agencies and state agencies and local agencies to um, put a lot of money <clears throat> and effort uh, towards studying bats and trying to find solutions and trying to figure out how to protect the bats that we have remaining. Um, you know, other threats um, also uh, habitat loss and fragmentation. Uh, it's kind of the story for every wildlife species. Um, there are uh, numerous bats uh, here in Virginia that require large contiguous tracts of forest. Uh, and so our ever expanding urbanization is a threat to that. Um, artificial light at night um, all the street lights and building lighting and everything, I mean, it's just everywhere, um, is, is a threat to bats. Um, it, uh, it actually uh, prevents some species of bats from being able to enter the lit areas uh, because uh, they're afraid of predation. Um, you know, some of our bat species are, are, are adapted to be in these dark forest interiors and so they avoid the lit areas and so um you know e even if you had say a, a city park that could be habitat to these bats if it's well lit from street lights it's essentially unavailable for those bats to use um so that that's a threat um also uh, increased pesticide usage you know our, our ever increasing reliance on, on chemicals and pesticides. Um, that's an area that we still don't understand well. Um, we're doing more and more research into that. Um, and, and we suspect that, uh, you know, first and foremost, if you're using pesticides to kill insects, that's less food available for bats. Uh, but also we believe that bats are consuming these chemically contaminated uh, insects and that's um, causing them to get sick and to die. Um, so that's an area that needs a lot more research. Um, and then finally, um, wind energy is actually, unfortunately, a, a threat to bats uh, here in Virginia. Um, we've uh, we've found that 
uh, bats are actually being attracted to these wind turbines during migration um, and they're getting killed um, and they don't even have to uh, get actually hit by the turbine. Uh, we found that they just have to get near enough uh, to where the low pressure zone behind that spinning blade uh, essentially causes their organs to rupture. Um, and it, 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 our, our latest data shows that it's not just a sighting issue where we could try to put these wind turbines out of their migratory pathways. Uh, they're actually being attracted to these uh, turbines. And so we're still trying to figure out why that is and, and how we can mitigate these impacts. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a, that's a great example of uh, everything has a cost. So clearly, you know, obviously renewable energy is important, but everything does have a cost and we have to consider, consider that. Uh, so white nose syndrome, um, this is where this is the latest spread map. It shows uh, all the counties uh, where bat biologists like myself have um, essentially swabbed bats and cultured it and found that they were infected with white nose syndrome. Um, so and, and again, it started uh, up in New York State uh, and it's just spread like an absolute wildfire across the uh, continent. Um, <laughs> it was a little uh, sad um, when I was putting this talk together. I pulled up the map of uh, where White Nose was when I started my PhD program. Um, and just in that time frame, we've gone from uh, from this to this. So that was a little shocking to me. OK, um, but there there is hope. I don't want it to be all doom and gloom. Um, there's a lot of great research going into um, how to protect bats uh, and and we're learning a lot uh, very quickly. Uh, so there is hope. Um, you know, researchers like me are, are working very diligently to protect our bats. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to kind of segue into uh, my research and, and what I'm doing and uh, how one studies bats, because you know, there's a lot of specialized techniques that we have to use. Um, so for my uh, PhD research, um, most of it has been focused uh, at Marine Corps Base Quantico and uh, Prince William Forest Park, uh, which is a national park, um, both located, uh, they're both conjoined um, and both represent uh, about 75,000 acres of uh, Piedmont Forest, uh, which is a, a very large tract of land. Uh, and it's it's interesting because it's, it's really located very close to Washington, D.C. Uh, Quantico and Prince William are only about 35 miles south of Washington, D.C. Um, and they also represent two very different land uses. Uh, you know, Quantico is all for uh, military training. So they're uh, blowing stuff up. They're running tanks through the woods. They're using smoke munitions for training. Um, they're shooting guns off and all that kind of stuff um, that could potentially uh, affect bats. Uh, and then Prince William Forest Park uh, is a very, very heavily visited park, uh, being that it's located so close to DC. Uh, and so visitor use as well can have uh, an impact on bats. Um, you know, things like uh, hazard tree removal um, near hiking trails. Um, bats tend to roost in uh, snags or dead trees uh, that could be accidentally cut down um, kind of in the name of, of visitor safety. And so, um, Essentially, the, the Department of Defense and the National Park Service, um, being federal landholders, uh, they are required by law to survey for endangered species and have a plan for how to uh, manage these species and manage their natural resources on their properties. Um, and so they uh, contracted me to come in and essentially figure out the what, where, when, why, how of, of bats on their properties. Um, they wanted to know uh, what type of bats they have, uh, where they are, what kind of habitat is important for them. And they wanted me to help them come up with a plan for uh, how can we protect bats while still allowing military planning or military training uh, to, to take place, because that's obviously important. Um, and then also how can we still continue to have support this this high level of, of visitors uh, to our park and so that the public can enjoy our park but uh, also meet our our mission uh, of protecting the wildlife and the natural resources that occur here um and so uh I, 
basically since 2017, I've been going out there for three months every summer uh, and I become nocturnal uh, and I, I go out and I capture bats and track them around and uh, try to figure out what type of, of habitat they need, what kind of trees they're in, um, the seasonal timing of when the bats are on these properties. Uh, because, for example, if you have a, a hazard tree that is leaning over one of the campsites, for example, at Prince William Forest Park, um, is there a certain time of year that we can cut this tree and we know that there's not going to be bats in that tree? Um, same with Quantico. Uh, is there Are there certain areas of the base where we need to avoid during certain times of the year, uh, practicing shooting off mortars or howitzers, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and I, it was really interesting experience. Um, the, the military uh, actually has been really proactive um, and, and open to uh, natural resource management on their installations. Um, and they've, they've been really uh, pleasant to work with and really uh, receptive of all this information. Um, you know, they are they are willing to move training to this different spot if this is really important bat habitat and whatnot. Um, and same goes for the National Park Service. So, um, but yeah, so uh, probably the, the largest tool that I use to study bats uh, is mist nets. Um, we have to actually capture the bats somehow. Um, and that's really important because we need to uh, confirm what species are there and, and actually physically getting them in hand is pretty much the only way to do that. Um, and then we also need to gather information uh, about reproduction. Uh, it's really important to know whether this habitat is high enough quality that uh, these bats are successfully reproducing and successfully adding new bats to the population uh, on these properties. And the only way to do that is to physically capture them. Uh, and so to do that, um, we go out and we erect these uh, big nets. It's a really fine mesh nylon uh, nets uh, strung out between poles with a pulley system. Uh, and we set these along uh, roads and trails and stream corridors um, where the bats are likely to be flying while they're foraging for insects at night. Uh, and we catch them in the nets. Um, and it's uh, actually very tricky. Um, because bats have that sophisticated echolocation, they're they're actually really good at seeing these mist nets and detecting them with their echolocation and avoiding them. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of funny the old saying "bat shit crazy" came from watching bats and how their erratic flight their flight patterns just look so erratic. Uh, but we've actually you know studied it with uh, slow motion cameras and stuff. Uh, and we found that they're actually incredibly agile flyers, uh, so much so that the military is studying uh, how their wings are shaped to try to make better airplanes. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, watching these bats, they're so, with that that echolocation and their agile flight, they're so good at avoiding these nets. So we have to really think like a bat and uh, try to find tricky places to put them around sharp turns in a road and stuff like that to, to trick them into running into these mist nets. Um, and so we typically do this from uh, sunset until about 3 a.m. or so, uh, and then we pack up and go home. Um, and when we check the nets about every 10 minutes uh, and the bats, um, if we get any bats in the net, um, which they get tangled in there, but it, it doesn't hurt them. Um, we carefully get them out and we bring them back to our workup station. Uh, and that's where we take a whole suite of measurements, um, like what type of bat it is, uh, its age, whether it's male, female, we look for the signs of reproduction, and then we take whatever samples we need. Uh, for example, uh, I do a lot of swabbing to check these bats for white nose syndrome. Um, and lately, we've actually been uh, swabbing them and sending them off to a CDC lab to test for uh, coronaviruses as well. Um, and then once we're, we're done taking that those measurements, if it's one of the species that we're uh, interested in, uh, like the northern long-eared bat, uh, which was just recently listed as an endangered species, um, then we'll actually give them a little haircut on their back and uh, glue a little miniaturized transmitter to their back, like a little backpack. And uh, you can see that in the bottom uh, left picture here. It's just a little tiny transmitter. Uh, and then we release them, and that's how we can actually find where they're going on the landscape. Um, now, this is a, a huge challenge because uh, larger wildlife species, we can put uh, GPS collars on. 
uh, so that we can, it's, it's just two way communicates with the satellite network. Um, and we can just sit back and watch the, where the animals are going on our computer. Uh, but that's not true for bats. Um, they do not make GPS tags small enough for bats. Uh, Cause again, these creatures are really, really small. Um, and so we have to rely on, on older technology. Uh, and it's, it's just a VHF radio that sends out a, a beep signal essentially. Uh, and we use these directional antennas uh, to listen for where the sound is is uh, loudest uh, and that's the direction we need to walk in to try to find the bat. Um, and so here's an example of a antenna that I use for tracking. Uh, it's this big directional antenna um, and it's, it's just old school radio technology. And uh, so we try to find track down the bats doing that and that can be really challenging um, because again, it's, it has to be so small that it's a really low powered transmitter uh, that only gives us a range of at best about a mile. Uh, and we're talking about creatures that can fly. Uh, some, some of these species can fly three, four miles in a night easily. Uh, in fact, there, there's a few species that can fly 20 to 30 miles in a night. And for those, we actually have to use aircraft uh, to track them. Um, so we try to track them uh, and then we find which uh, roost tree they're in. Um, and we take a whole suite of measurements uh, to characterize what type of tree they're in uh, and what type of habitat they're in. Um, and then that's all information that we use to inform the, the land managers uh, about what, what they need to protect and, and how they need to manage their forests. Um, and here's an example in the, on the right, uh, if you can see it, it's a little Northern long-eared bat tucked up under some loose bark in a tree there. And you can actually see the transmitter wire sticking off of him. And he's got a little armband on there. I don't know if I can do a, oh, there we go, a laser pointer. You see him? Mm -hmm. He's right there. <laughs> um, and so we were finding uh, that northern, we were mainly looking for northern long-eared bats. Uh, we were finding that northern long-eared bats uh, really like to use um, trees in later stages of decay uh, that have loose bark like this uh, or cavities in it. Um, the cavities are particularly important for uh, mother northern long-eared bats uh, with pups uh, because it provides uh, thermal insulation uh, to help keep the pups warm. And they'll, they'll actually form a, a maternity colony of, you know, about 10 to 15 uh, adult female bats and then all their pups. Uh, and they huddle together in these insulated, uh, hollowed out dead trees. Um, and, uh, and then... And that just helps the the babies to develop faster, the warmer temperatures. Um, so, you know, trees that uh, historically you might go out and, and be like, oh, you know, that's a nasty looking dead tree. I, I just need to knock that over and get rid of it. Those are actually the really important trees uh, that we're finding for these bats. Um, so yeah, um, a little side project uh, that I did just for fun is uh, it, it's just so challenging to track these bats sometimes because uh, again, they can fly. So they don't care whether uh, they're roosting in the middle of a blackberry thicket or a catbriar thicket or something like that, or they uh, flew across the Potomac River or something like that. Um, you know, I have, to, I have to follow them on foot because I can't fly. Um, so my friends and I actually, as a little side project, uh, we developed a, a drone that we can send up uh, that can track the bats. Um, and so that, that was a fun little project. Um, unfortunately, I haven't gotten to actually try it out yet um, for my field research, uh, just because it's difficult to try to get permission to fly a drone on a military installation. Um, <laughs> you can imagine why. Um, so, but yeah, so there, there's stuff underway like that to try to make this uh, easier because uh, it takes a lot of man hours and a lot of effort to, to track these bats. Um, and we, we end up losing uh, quite a few bats as well because they just take off and, and we can't follow them. Um, so advances like uh, bat tracking drones can hopefully help us in the future. Um, another method that uh, I don't use out at Quantico or Prince William, but I just want to talk about, um, it, it's another way to capture bats. Uh, called harp traps. And uh, just like it sounds, they kind of look like a harp. Uh, it's a frame with a bunch of uh, fishing line, monofilament fishing lines strung between it tightly. Uh, and it's two layers of it offset slightly. And then it's got a collection bag underneath it. Um, and I use harp traps all the time when I'm doing 
uh, bridge surveys because uh, bats love to live in the expansion joints of bridges. They like to live in culverts, uh, underground water cisterns, uh, and then of course caves. Um, and when you have just one portal that you know they're going to come out of and you know that you're going to get a bunch all at once, uh, mist nets are not very good because they get tangled in mist nets and it can take sometimes five, even 10 minutes to get a bat out of a mist net if they're really tangled. Um, and so harp traps are perfect because they basically just uh, hit the monofilament uh, line and drop into the collection bag. And so I can just collect a ton of bats in the collection bag, wait for the emergence to be done, and then just go out there and pull them all out of the bag. Um, so that's a really useful method. Um, if any of you are familiar with New River Cave um, here in uh, near Blacksburg, Virginia, um, the picture on the right is me doing a, a survey there. Um, and all the tarp is just closing off all the area around the harp trap to funnel them in. Um, and then the picture on the left is a, another uh, harp trap that I used uh, catching bats coming out of a, a big underground uh, culvert um, near Bristol, Virginia. Um, and I actually didn't show in that picture, but I took tarps and closed off all the rest of that. So that's another another method we use for catching bats. Um, also at uh, Quantico and Prince William, um, I made heavy use of bat detectors uh, in acoustic survey. Um, and this, this is great. They're essentially like uh, trail cameras, if you're familiar with those. Uh, but instead of taking a picture when they're activated, um, they're listening for the echolocation signals of bats. And when they hear it, they start recording. Uh, and I can actually take those echolocation recordings uh, and identify them to species. Um, and, and, and tell what bats are, are on the landscape. Um, and so uh, the device I used is pictured up in the top right there. Um, and then the picture on the left is kind of hard to see. That's by design because I don't want people to steal these things. Um, <laughs> you can see there's a, one of these bat detectors uh, cable locked to a tree right there. And then I've got the microphone on this pole and the microphone's right there. Um, and so the these are great because um, I can deploy a lot of these out on the landscape in a variety of different habitats. Um, and they sit out there uh, recording all night long, every night for the entire summer. And so they can collect a ton of data that I can use to build predictive models for where bats uh, occur on the landscape. I can tell uh, when they show up. I, I also ran these bat detectors uh, uh, subset of them year round uh, for a couple of years on these two properties. And that'll help me determine when they show up, when they leave, that kind of stuff. Um, and so they're really great. The, the downside is um, bat echolocation uh, is not perfect. Um, it can be really difficult to determine some species. Um, and so we still have to do those mist net surveys to confirm which species are on a property. And then we can use the acoustic surveys uh, to sort of uh, augment that. Um, but yeah, th this is really cool technology. Um, it's getting better and better every day. Uh, when I first started doing bats um, about 12 or 13 years ago, um, this technology was really not well developed. Um, we were still using old devices that uh, recorded bats to you know cassette tapes and stuff like that um and we didn't it, it was all hand iding these calls um, but now we've got really sophisticated bat detectors um, and we've got uh machine learning algorithms and automatic id programs that we can run these large data sets through and it can tell me um what species are on the landscape so that's a, a really cool area uh, that that's rapidly developing um and then uh I also, you know, the fun of a PhD is they kind of let you seek your own funding and, and uh, just decide what side projects you want to do as a part of your PhD. Uh, and so I was, uh, you know, I was growing frustrated with how difficult it was to capture bats, uh, especially these rare bat species. And so I started thinking there's there's got to be ways to, to lure in bats, right? I mean, people, uh, you know, bait trail cameras, uh, you know, People throw donuts and stuff into bear traps to get them to go in. I mean, you know, lots of species can be can be baited in. And so I, I started thinking, and uh, 
one of the technologies that I tested and started developing uh, is acoustic lure technologies. Uh, it's essentially uh, just a loudspeaker, a special loudspeaker that plays uh, echolocation calls, um, and you deploy it in front of your misnet and hope that it draws bats in. Um, and the, the concept there is that uh, bats uh, use echolocation um, not just for navigation and hunting, but they also emit some social calls to keep in touch with each other, uh, to set up territories, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so I figured if I could find the right call, uh, I could actually lure bats in. Um, fast forward after doing research on this for a couple of years, um, I unfortunately never had a whole lot of success with this, but some of my colleagues um, down in Florida uh, with the Florida bonneted bat um, and some of my colleagues in Europe actually had a lot of success with this technology. Um, but I, I think that uh, I just didn't quite find the magic call to use uh, here in Virginia. And so this is something that I'm still working on. Um, I uh, got a, a paper in the works that's uh, talking about uh, essentially why I, I don't think this worked uh, here in, in Virginia. Um, and it, it has to do with, uh, without getting too much into the weeds, it has to do with the natural history and the, the biology of the bats we have here in Virginia. Um, they're not as social as bat, uh, a lot of bat species over in Europe uh, and the Florida bonneted bat. For example, the Florida bonneted bat, um, the males uh, set up a, a harem of females, um, a group of females that they uh, guard essentially from other males. Uh, and they use a lot of social calls to keep in touch with their females um, and to drive away other males. Um, and so, uh, my colleagues uh, just happened to record uh, a social call, which is very difficult to record these calls because they don't emit them very frequently, um, that they they think is likely a, a territorial call. Uh, and when they started broadcasting this, they started catching a bunch of Florida bonneted bats. Um, similar story with some species over in Europe. Uh, they have some more territorial, more social species. Um, our bats here in Virginia uh, are just, they're just not super social. Um, they, they do set up colonies and they communicate with each other, but uh, we call it kind of a fission fusion dynamic. Um, they form these colonies only when they really need it for thermoregulation uh, mainly, uh, and then they dissolve when they are no longer needed. Uh, and so they're, they're not these like super tight knit uh, families that, that use a lot of social calls to keep in touch with each other. Uh, but it was a really interesting project and, and I think it shows promise. Uh, it just needs a lot more work. Um, I'm, I'm one of the only people um, in the eastern U.S. working on this, so we need a lot more people and bright minds thinking about how we can improve this and make it work better. Um, now, one thing I did have success with uh, is, you know, that the acoustic lure was to increase uh, misnet captures, physical captures of bats, but I also had uh, an idea well, is there a, a way that I could attract bats to my bat detectors? And this would be kind of the equivalent of like uh, dragging a deer carcass in front of a trail camera, right? To attract wildlife. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, what, what do bats eat? They eat insects. How can I attract insects? Well, entomologists use ultraviolet lights at night, usually in conjunction with a white sheet to attract a ton of in, uh, insects at night. Um, and these are insects that uh, our bats here in Virginia eat. Um, and so I uh, built this custom. My, my dad happens to be a, an electrical engineer. And so he helped me build this uh, custom ultraviolet light lure uh, that comes on at sunset and you hang it in front of uh, a, an array of bat detectors. Uh, and it creates this huge uh, swarm of insects around the bat detectors um, that I was hoping the bats would find and take advantage of and it would increase acoustic detection of, of bats. Um, and this could have really important implications for uh, both research, but uh, especially uh, the environmental consulting world where uh, they have to do these, these surveys to clear a property for development. Um, and as these species get rarer and rarer, uh, we're finding that you have to deploy bat detectors for obscenely long amounts of time uh, to achieve a, a acceptable level of certainty that bats aren't on the landscape. And so if we could use something like this and have that time required to be certain that an endangered species isn't present, that would be really useful. 
Um, and so, yeah, uh, essentially they're uh, ultraviolet black lights like you would find in a nightclub or people use around Halloween um, and it, it attracts the insects. Um, and I, I found that it uh, actually works pretty well. Um, it, uh, it, but the, the kicker is it has a, a very species dependent effect. Uh, and so I found that Eastern red bats and big brown bats, which are two of our most common bats here in the state, um, they, they were primarily the ones attracted to these lights. Um, the, a couple of endangered species that I was hoping to be attracted, um, I didn't see any significant increase, uh, but I did see an increase in northern long-eared bats, uh, which was really interesting. Uh, and that's, that's one of our uh, endangered species here in the state. Uh, now, the effect was interesting. Without getting too uh, into the weeds, um, I had an array of bat detectors uh, some right at the light, and then some were on the fringes of these survey sites. And I had the increase in northern long-eared bats at the fringes of these sites and after I turned the light off. And I actually saw a decrease in northern long-eared bat calls on my bat detectors right at the light. Um, and so I, I dug into the natural history of, of northern long-eared bats a little bit, uh, and they're, they're a, a very forest interior um, what we call clutter-adapted bat species. Um, and so they don't really like flying out in open areas. And so I, and they're, they're a very small-bodied bat as well compared to the uh, big brown bats and the uh, re eastern red bats. And so I, I suspect that they uh, were uh, averse to the light. Um, and so future work needs to look at uh, possibly turning on and off the light alternating um, so that it attracts a bunch of insects, but then turns the light off uh, and hopefully allows the northern long-eared bats to come in and feed. So this was a really uh, a fun project. It, it felt a little bit like a mad science project building this custom uh, device. And it, it looks kind of crazy up in the trees. I got, uh, I deployed uh, trail cameras as well, just to keep an eye on it. Um, and got a lot of very confused uh, looks from the park visitors, which I thought was really funny. Um, cause it essentially looks like these two, it got nicknamed the electric jellyfish. Um, just the way that I built it, it sort of looks like these two, uh, luminescent jellyfish hanging from the trees. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it was interesting and it, and it shows promise. Uh, and I plan to do a lot more research into this in the future. Um, in fact, uh, some colleagues at Bat Conservation International, um, did a, a, a similar project using ultraviolet lights um, and they were deploying these outside of known hibernacula or caves uh, that little brown bats uh, hibernate in during the winter um, and they were using these in, both in the fall and in the spring uh, to try to provide an easy food source for these bats uh, so that they could fatten up uh, before they go into hibernation and hopefully have an easier time surviving uh, white nose syndrome. Um, and they also had a, a good bit of success with this technology. So it's really cool. Um, I, I enjoyed doing that project. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I get to do all kinds of fun side projects um, here at Virginia Tech. And, and probably one of the biggest and coolest side projects I did um, is we went down to Florida. We were uh, we were interested, you know, prescribed fire uh, is a really important habitat management tool. Um, and, and so we, we want it to be able to, to continue, obviously, um, but it could potentially harm these rare bats uh, if not done properly. Um, and so we wanted to uh, see whether bats during the wintertime, um, when they're hibernating up in the trees, because um, again, we have those two groups of bats. Not all bats go down into caves to hibernate. Some migrate south, and on a really cold day, they'll go into a short bout of hibernation called torpor. Um, and so we wanted to see whether these bats going into torpor up in the trees um, would die, essentially, from uh, a prescribed fire um, during the dormant season. Uh, and so we went down to Florida at uh, Camp Landing, which is a, a National Guard base uh, in sort of north central Florida. Um, and we went out and caught, uh, Eastern red bats, uh, Seminole bats and 40 bats, and we put transmitters on them and we would go out really early in the morning. We would find their roost tree, uh, and then we would actually, uh, do a prescribed burn in the forest stand that we located, uh, the bats in, and, uh, we would see what happens. Uh, it was just total experimental. We wanted to see what happened. 
Um, and we were pleasantly surprised uh, that all of our bats survived. Um, most of them actually seemed so unfazed from it that they just wrote it out up in their tree. Um, and then a few did flush, but they came right back the next day. Um, so that's really useful information. Um, now, this needs to be done. Uh, we need to do a lot more research into this, and we need to do it in uh, places where it gets even colder because um, it, it never got all that cold in Virginia. And the colder it gets, uh, the longer it takes them to uh, essentially wake up and get out of the way of a fire. Um, so, but this was, this was really a, a neat project and it was, uh, fun to track bats and then get to, get to play with fire a little bit. So, yeah. Um, so now the, the last part, um, is just how y'all can help. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, we, we need the public to be, uh, more informed than they ever have been about bats. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, I, I think that's something that, your organization uh, can help with, um, and maybe already does help with. Um, you know, I, I love doing uh, outreach and education as a part of my job. Um, and in fact, uh, every year um, our lab hosts a uh, congressional bat night in Rock Creek Park, uh, which is a national park right in the heart of uh, Washington, DC. Um, and we bring in uh, tons of agency types and, and congressional types, and we uh, take them out bat netting so that they can experience bats firsthand. Uh, and we've seen a lot of positive impact from, from that event and, and other events similar. Um, there are a lot of great resources out there uh, for lesson plans and, and information and, and bat activities. Um, you know, I've, I've seen tons of great lesson plans, uh, all K through 12. Um, out there. And I'm I'm pleasantly surprised every time I um, do a Google search and look for resource, resources, I keep finding even more and more. So I'm, I'm happy that um, more is out there. Um, but Bat Conservation International uh, is probably one of my favorite places to look for resources. Um, and uh, I believe they also have uh, the website batweek.org. Um, Bat Week is is a great time. Uh, it's October 24th through the 31st every year. Uh, that is a great time to hold public programs to raise awareness about bats. The only kicker is that in Virginia, most of our bats are uh, either migrated south or starting to hibernate in caves during that time of year. Um, so doing some summer events also uh, where you can actually have uh, a bat detector and, and you know have people actually listen to bats is also helpful. Um, I did find uh, there's a, a, I don't know much about them, but there's a Bat Conservation and Rescue of Virginia that has some really great resources. Um, and if you have anybody who, uh, you know, asks you about a, a bat that they need rehab, that might be a good place um, for you to point them. Um, Project Learning Tree uh, and Project uh, EDU Bat uh, both have some really great lesson plans, uh, K through 12 uh, for bats. Uh, I mean, all kinds of stuff, games, everything. Um, videos, all kinds of stuff. So those are some really great resources. Um, um, also, uh, one thing I wanted to mention to you all is uh, bat detectors, um, the price has been coming down a lot recently. Um, and Wildlife Acoustics makes uh, a bat detector that you can plug into um, an Android phone, or you can get a, a Apple version that can plug into iPhones or an iPad. Um, and uh, it, it, you get a free subscription to their software as well that allows you to actually uh, see the echolocation pulses of the bats. Um, and so I, I would recommend uh, as an organization possibly investing in one of those for your, your public uh, programs, uh, or if you just want one for yourself, they're a lot of fun to play with. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you want information for that. Um, you know, when I first started getting into bats, I mean, bat detectors were uh, thousands of dollars. Um, the research grade ones are, are still about a thousand dollars, but um, these uh, these ones that are meant for sort of public outreach and programs, I, I think last time I checked, they were only like a hundred bucks or 150 bucks or something like that. Uh, and they're really cool. Um, I, I enjoy using them for public programs. It uh, just adds that, that really fun element uh, to have an evening program in, in a place like Clater Lake State Park. Um, and have one of these, and, and people can actually listen to the bats that are flying overhead. Um, also, it's uh, also, I think, important to uh, have an answer to the two most common questions I get. <laughs> um, I get called all the time about this. Um, people are asking, I have bats in my house, I have bats in my attic, what do I do? 
Um, unfortunately, the answer to that is uh, you just got to call a, uh, a certified wildlife control specialist, um, but be sure that they are uh, bat certified um, so that they, they know how to do it uh, responsibly um, because it's, uh, it's illegal to um, kill bats and it's, it's illegal to, uh, unless it's you know, the fine line is unless it's a human health or safety thing, but uh, generally it's illegal to, um, and a bad idea uh, to essentially just close off an attic that has a bunch of bats in it because uh, they'll all die in there and make a terrible stinky mess. Um, but it's also illegal to kill these bats. Um, they're all protected. Um, so you want uh, somebody that's certified um, to do a bat, a proper bat exclusion during the correct time of year. Um, and the correct time of year uh, is typically like late summer, fall, um, when the, the babies are uh, old enough to fly. Uh, and so you install a one-way door and they all fly out and they can't get back in. Um, and then you can patch up wherever the hole, uh, the hole is that they're coming out of. Um, so I, I like to just have a list of uh, local wildlife control specialists that I know are a bat certified um, whenever I do a bat program, because uh, I inevitably always get asked. Uh, the second one is I, I get calls all the time about people who uh, found a bat flying around in their house and uh, or their shed or something like that. And they're wondering whether they need to get rabies shots. Um, of course, uh, I do not recommend giving medical advice unless you are a doctor or a rabies specialist. Um, and so the, the best answer there um, is to point point them to the Virginia Department of Health. Um, they'll actually have uh, a nurse call and walk through a standard questionnaire that they have uh, to determine whether it was uh, sort of an uh, exposure event that qualifies to get rabies uh, shots. Um, and it's, it's not likely that they were exposed generally. So it's, it's important to call the Department of Health first not just show up to an emergency room and tell them, I think I might've gotten bit by a bat because then you will get the shots and they are very expensive. Um, so generally just for your information, um, the, the criteria for an actual rabies exposure um, is you were bitten by a bat and knows that you've been bitten by a bat, obviously, then you need to get the rabies vaccine or the rabies post-exposure series. Um, Number two, you are in direct bare skinned contact with a bat and you can't rule out that a bite has occurred. Um, and then three, the one that I, I typically get all the time and, that, and it's just such a hard call is you were in a room with a bat and are unable to tell or articulate whether an exposure took place. For example, uh, you found the bat in a room with a, a baby um, or a, a older adult or uh, you woke up so you're unconscious in a room with a bat. Um, and that's really where the, the Department of Health people um, go into detail, a detailed questionnaire to determine whether or not um, you actually need to go get the, the rabies post-exposure series. So anyways, I just tell this to you uh, so that you can be prepared when you go out there and do public program that you will inevitably get asked one of these two questions. Um, people will, if you do a BAT program, they'll, they'll inevitably see you as a BAT expert and you're probably going to get a text message or a call from a friend's neighbor's friend that found a bat in their house and just knows that you do bat stuff. So be prepared for that. Um, also, as an organization, uh, I don't know if y'all have uh, done any bat house workshops or not, uh, but that's a, a great way to do it, uh, both um, internally where your members build bat houses and put them up, but also possibly uh, hosting a, a workshop for the public. Uh, to, to build or install bat houses. Um, they're really useful, uh, particularly in areas like Rock Creek Park, um, where um, habitat is limited um, and the bat houses, um, you know, provide uh, with that, with, it's sort of an easy way to provide uh, habitat for them that we know is good. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Um, the, there's a little bit of research uh, at the academic level um, going into these bat houses. Um, and the latest research that I've seen points to these rocket box style bat houses actually being the best and the most likely to be uh, actually used by bats. Uh, and that's this picture I have over on the right. Um, we're doing a project right now where we installed, I can't remember how many, I think it was maybe 10 or so of these rocket box 
that houses um, in Rock Creek Park uh, in downtown DC. Um, and they, the research is suggesting that they're the best um, because they're, they're well protected from predators um, being on a pole rather than attached to the side of a house uh, or a tree because uh, that uh, allows predators to be able to climb up there. Um, and then also um, it has multiple sides uh, as compared to uh, the sort of the traditional bat house style like this. Um, and that allows to have a, a sunny side and a shaded side and, you know, semi sun side, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it also has multiple chambers, layered chambers. And so that all allows the bats to pick the right temperature range that they need. Um, so I, I highly recommend that style. Uh, that's not to say that the other styles uh, aren't, aren't good. Um, they're, they're fine as well, but um, if you really want to put out the best possible bat house, these rocket box styles are, are the best. Um, there's a, a few good resources out there. Um, the Bat House Builders Handbook uh, put out by Bat Conservation International is probably the best resource. Um, it's a little bit hard to find. Uh, so if any of you need it, just shoot me an email uh, and I'm happy to send you the PDF. But I think you can still find it by Googling it. Um, most of that information is also um, on Bat Conservation International's website. Um, it's it's just spread out among the multiple pages, and I really like having like the one PDF document. Um, also, uh, Merlin Tuttle, um, who is one of the founders of Bat Conservation International, um, he just came out with a, a an updated uh, bat house guide. Um, but I I believe it you, you have to pay for it. I I don't think it's free, um, and it's a little expensive at uh, thirty bucks or so. Um, but that's probably the most up to date resource. Um, but this this bat house builders handbook uh, the information hasn't changed that much since it came out. Um, so yeah, bat conservation international is a great resource. Uh, Merlin Tuttle's bat conservation is a, another organization that. Uh, is is known for having really good resources and information. Um, I also recommend uh, you know get on Google Scholar and uh, you know read some primary literature too. Um, there was just a paper published by uh, Dr. Joy O'Keefe. Uh, I don't remember which university she's at, um, but she's got some good papers out there, and they're they're a they're a fun read. Um, and so I, I recommend uh, you know keeping up with that as well because that's where the the latest and greatest, so to speak, information is. Um, and then finally, um, I'm not as familiar with it, um, but bat-friendly landscaping and gardening uh, can be important, um, especially for more urbanized areas. Um, there are species of bats that actually do fairly well in urban areas, uh, but they still do need insect prey. Uh, and so having these this bat-friendly landscaping and gardening uh, to provide foraging habitat for them is uh, important. Uh, and there's lots of resources online for that uh, from Bat Conservation International and similar organizations. Um, and then finally, uh, there's been uh, it's a new push uh, and, and interest in getting citizen scientists involved in actually surveying for bats on the landscape, um, generally using bat detectors. Um, as the price of these bat detectors come down, um, organizations are uh, and private citizens are able to purchase them, um, and uh, there's efforts to to organize people to go out and do these surveys. Because um, the the bat researcher world is really small, um, we're we're limited on manpower, and so if we can take advantage of of citizen scientists and organizations like uh, Virginia Master Naturalists uh, to go out there and collect this uh, critical information uh, that allows us to track populations on a, on a large scale, uh, that's really important. Um, unfortunately, I'm not aware of anything in Virginia that's going on with that right now, um, but in a couple other states, um, the North American Bat Monitoring Program, uh, is it's a, a continent-wide um, bat acoustic monitoring program uh, that aims to, to do just that, to um, monitor bat populations uh, year round across the continent and, and gather um, this really valuable information. Um, they're starting to use citizen scientists in other states. Um, I'm not aware of that happening here in Virginia, um, but I, I'm pushing for it. Uh, and I urge all of you to uh, reach out to, to NABAT, North American Bat Monitoring Program, and, and ask about it uh, and, and keep pushing for it because I think it's uh, important. And with that, uh, I'll take any questions. Thanks for uh, listening to me blab about bats. <laughs> 
think one question we had, somebody wanted to know how to attract bats to their property. I think it covered that. But did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that, that's a good uh, that's a good question. I get that all the time. Um, you know, uh, bat friendly landscaping can be helpful. Um, but uh, and putting up bat houses can be helpful as well. Um, but un unfortunately, uh, bat houses are kind of tricky. Um, it, it can take years sometimes for bats to discover these bat houses uh, and to actually take up residence in them. Um, if after a year or more, if, if you're not getting bats, then you might want to uh, rethink about where it's located. Um, and, and all that information is in that, that guide. Um, and I can, I can send that to Judy and you can send that out to the group. Um, but you know, it's, it's important, uh, what color you paint the bat house and where you place it, whether it's in full sun, that kind of stuff. And de it depends on the region you're in. Um, so you can do stuff like that, uh, to try to encourage bats to move in. Um, but. Okay. Uh, just. Yeah. Go ahead. Did it include a link to that acoustic meter? I had checked that out earlier when I heard about it. So if anybody's yeah. interested in buying one, yeah, link is yeah I can send that out too. Um, yeah, so the the bat houses are are uh, kind of tricky, you know, and and it's I, I will say um, bats prefer natural habitat to bat houses generally, uh, and so if you have good habitat around you, you may put up a bat house and they may never use it. Um, but it's better to put it up and it not be used than not be there and they need it, um, of course. Um, so that can be something that can be a little discouraging to people sometimes, uh, but it's important just to to remind them of that fact that, uh, you know, it, it may not be important right now, but in a few years, uh, you know, it might be important because the forest changes over time uh, and they might end up needing it. So, yeah. Oh, and uh, yeah, I saw somebody ask in the chat about... Uh, spray lures i think um yeah there's there's some products out there uh i've seen them on amazon uh that claim to be bat house attractants and that is total snake oil do not do not invest in that stuff um i do not recommend it it, it does nothing <laughs> um the the best you can do is build a, a bat house the correct way and put it in the right place so yeah Oh yes, and yeah, I, I just opened up the chat. Um, yes, that the e eco meter or echo meter touch two uh, from Wildlife Acoustics is the one that I recommend. Um, unfortunately, um, I would like them to come out with a version that works on both Android and iPhone. Currently, you have to buy the version that works for one or the other. Um, so just be aware of that when you're buying it. Uh, that if you need Android, buy the Android version or by the Apple version. Um, so yeah, that's that's a great bat detector. Um, and it, it comes with uh, uh, their software, a sort of a light version actually of the uh, software that I use to, to analyze bat calls. And it's cool because you can see their, their echolocation pulses in real time. Um, and it'll even try to give you an ID uh, for what bat you're listening to. Um, just know that it's not, the best. <laughs> um, it's it. It really still takes uh, an expert um, to uh, to essentially check the results of these auto ID programs. Um, but the suggestion is is typically pretty close. Um, you you can be if it says big brown bat, uh, you you can be pretty sure it's a big brown bat, and that's probably uh, it's one of our most common bats uh, around here that you'll see. So that one's probably pretty good. But uh, if it if it says anything about a myotis bat. Um, those are very difficult to tell apart um, with uh, with those programs. So, but yeah, any other questions? Oh, I uh, see a question about how did I power the UV lamps? Um, yeah, that that was a uh, I powered them off of a, a bank of eight uh, car batteries, actually. Um, yeah, and, and those weighed. Uh, I think it was a couple hundred pounds. Um, it the lamps that I used um, are the sort of they're they're old uh, fluorescent ultraviolet tubes that are very power hungry, um, and I needed them to run for a fairly long amount of time unattended. Uh, and so when I did the math, I was like, oh, "Good lord, I need a lot of batteries for that." Um, and I, I went with those lights instead of more modern LED 
uh, black lights or UV lights um, because that's the that's the gold standard that most entomologists still use. And so I, I wanted to be, and there's it's well established in the scientific literature that uh, those lights work to attract the insects that I needed to attract. Uh, and so I wanted to just be sure that the lights work and I remove a variable out of there um, by you know not using modern LED lights because um, entomologists are are slowly adopting UV lights, uh, LED UV lights that don't require as much power. Um, and I just wasn't sure whether they would work or not. Um, now moving forward, uh, that's one of the main things that I'm going to investigate is whether I can use uh, newer UV uh, LEDs instead of these uh, traditional, you know, glass fluorescent tubes um, because they require a lot less energy. Um, I've, I've got a, a, a cheap uh, UV light that I bought off Amazon that's powered by one of those little USB five volt battery packs, you know, and it can run all night on that. Uh, and so I, I want to see if I can use that uh, to attract bats instead of this massive bank of, of car batteries. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, there's a question about if funding is reduced for the Virginia Cave Board, how will that affect the BAT study? Um, I, I have to admit, I, I'm actually not familiar with the Virginia Cave Board. Uh, whoever asked that question, would you mind telling me what it's, that is? It's a government agency, uh, part of um, DCR, and okay. they're cutting fat from the budget, and that's one they're talking about reducing. They're, they're, we've been asked to write letters to support it, but I didn't know if that, that affects you at all. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it would. Uh, we do work with DCR. Um, and uh, actually, we work with, if any of you are familiar with Will Orndorf, um, he's the cave and karst specialist for DCR. Um, we work closely with him, uh, and they fund uh, a lot of our uh, gray bat research. Um, uh, gray bats are an endangered species here in Virginia, um, and they're unique because they actually live in caves year round. Um, they're one of those sort of special cases that doesn't live in trees during the summer and then either migrate or live in caves during the wintertime. They live in caves year round. Um, and uh, they are actually, um, they were came very close to being wiped off the face of the planet. Um, and primarily that was because of disturbance uh, to their caves. Uh, they're fairly sensitive to disturbance, um, like people going in uh, and, caving and, and disturbing them. Um, now, I, I do need to point out that um, cavers are generally great uh, conservationists and they've been incredibly helpful. Um, it's mainly uh, the irresponsible cavers and um, who are, are the ones that were harming gray bats. Um, and I, I would guess, um, so what, what essentially helped them, uh, and they're getting close to where they may not need to be on the Endangered Species Act anymore, um, is gating cave entrances. Um, and, and that, I'm wondering if the Virginia Cave Board funds uh, gating of these cave entrances. Um, and it's, it's essentially, you know, building bars, uh, and permanently installing bars across the cave entrance to keep uh, people out, but they're designed in a way to where the bats can still come in and out easily. Um, and so that uh, is, what we suspect has uh, led to the massive population increase of gray bats uh, across Virginia. And I'm, I'm wondering if uh, the, gating, the gating program uh, was a part of that Virginia Cave Board. So um, I'm, I'm sure that that's uh, important and that's sad to hear that they're uh, reducing their budget. If we don't speak up, but if we speak up, that's... Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm glad there's groups like you who can who can do that. Are there any other questions? Doesn't look like. It. Thank you so much for sharing with us. This has been wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I think you do have a number of people in this group that are interested in carrying on with some of this. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, please go out and and spread your knowledge about bats. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the type of program, uh, Judy, that you do in, in parks uh, around Virginia, um, you know, that's uh, perfect to do, uh, you know, an evening bat presentation or something like that with people who are camping in parks. Um, and especially if you can, um, you know, incorporate uh, one of those bat detectors.
So that will be fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for letting me uh, come Thank talk you. to you about bats. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Okay, everybody. Uh, just so you know, I'm having extreme internet problems. I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so if I freeze or disappear, <laughs> you'll know what happened. Um, Try Bart turning Glazer your video had... off. That's uh, it was. Fun. It actually was off, and it's still that did not help. Oh. I think it might have to do with the weather or something. I've not had this happen before. So anyway, uh, Barb had a couple of things that she wanted to talk to you about. And I don't know if anyone else has any other business type things that they want to uh, get in before we close this evening. But Barb, you want to go ahead? I do. I do. Well, first of all, I want to thank Sam because I think his information has really inspired me and probably not the only one who, you know, this could be another way to you know, for a volunteer kind of opportunity for us to promote and educate about bats. And I have my own personal story, which if you want to know about it, you ask me privately. So I, I, what I really wanted to talk about tonight was that I uh, chair the activities committee and I have for the last three years. And I've been serving as the vice president. My term runs out in May. So we have to elect someone new in the annual meeting in June. That primary responsibility of the vice president is to coordinate presenters for the chapter meetings and to help to organize our activities and things we like to do that are fun. We need someone new to step in to this role. It's pretty straightforward responsibility. Um, our committee is small, but we are mighty, and um, and we are very comfortable with dividing up responsibilities so no one doesn't, like, thank you, Judy, you are responsible for this meeting tonight. It's so interesting. Um, the chair just keeps track of the calendar and oversees that the speakers are notified and that details of the meetings are in place and calendars updated and information is available for the week of the calendar and that you know we thank the presenter at the end it's it's pretty straightforward um so if you if you're looking for a volunteer opportunity this might be something that you will be interested in we we need someone our committee has the summer mostly planned and we also have stepped into the fall and have things for the first couple of months so um for our range speakers for our chapter meetings at least. So if you are interested in, in joining in, this is a good time because there's plenty of time to ease into that responsibility and not feel too stressed about it. So contact me if you wanna do it or contact Chris Sokol, please. Um, second topic, one of the volunteer projects that I do is for Trail Monitor at Falls Ridge which is a neighbor nature conservancy property. It's closed to the public right now, but we trail monitors have continued to monitor weekly and we can arrange field trips or they can be arranged to the nature conservancy on that property. We have quite a few folks that have uh, signed up and they're on the list to commit to walking the trail and filling out the report that the Nature Conservancy asks of us. But we have empty slots in February and in March. And if you would like to uh, become a Nature Conservancy volunteer, you need to uh, get on their website and contact them. There are forms to fill out and, and things that you have to be aware of and commit to. And you probably would want to walk with one of the uh, seasoned volunteers to figure out the trails and the expectations. Uh, and by the way, I've signed up for March 25th. Sandy is my walking partner and she's not able to do it that week. So I'm open for someone who would like to join in and perhaps become a future volunteer or just for fun for that day. Also, for the Nature Conservancy, they have uh, mentioned that they have act. They need for they have a need for 
more trail monitors at Bottom Creek Gorge, which is still in Montgomery County, despite the fact that it's more than an hour, little more than an hour's drive from here. So the Roanoke chapter has done quite a bit of the monitoring, but uh, it's a lovely, wonderful place to go. It's the second highest falls across the gorge in the state of Virginia, lovely trails, lots of interesting um, things that have happened on that property historically with cemeteries and things like that. So I would be willing to, I have lots of experience at that piece of property. So I would be willing to, and I plan to volunteer to do it sometime in the spring or summer as one of my turns. If you'd like to go there, let me know. Um, Butch Kelly is the person who organizes the schedule for bottom for uh, uh, False Ridge. So you would need to contact him to get on the calendar, but you need to be a member of the committee or uh, of the group that, that does the trail mon monitoring with the Nature Conservancy first. So anyone have questions about that? I just say that volunteering there would give you amazing access to a place that you wouldn't have access to otherwise. That is true. true. That is true. Uh, Barbara, what was that day that, that you needed someone to walk with you? It's the week of March 25th. So when you sign up, you're given a week time frame, and you can then figure out what works the best for you. So I can adjust with whoever wants to walk with me that week, March well, 25th. I'm, yeah, I would love to do that. Can I volunteer? Yes, yes, Will. I'm gonna write your name down right now. <laughs> you want my phone number? Are you, uh, sure. <laughs> uh, 304-325. Three one five one. Thanks. Well, and and I'll get a hold of you, and we'll figure out what works so we can be out there. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, when Butch got back to us with the schedule, he said that nineteen people had, you know, they are on the list as trail monitors, and they're not all of us are master naturalists on that list, but we still had, um, I think, four weeks. I think there's only one empty one now. Oh, because that's good. I contacted Butch. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. Are good, you... But it, it still is a need, I think, for more volunteers. Yes, that's right. Are you done, Barb? Yes, I am. I Thank know you. it's it, it's late. It, we've had a long meeting, but um, I have two. We, we try to highlight some projects each month, and um, I'm going to take one minute to highlight something, and then I'm going to ask Judy. She wanted to talk a little bit about Vernal Pools and Frog Watch. Um, you may have seen on the calendar that there I've way in advance set a date for the Bluebird kickoff. Um, but I, and if you're an older, a, a member who's been in the organization for a while, you know about our Bluebird trails. Um, but if you're new to the organization and you wanna get involved with Bluebird trails, we have one at the high school that the, that our organization monitors, one at the middle school. The one at Price's Fork Elementary is a little bit up in the air right now because there's been some construction there. So I'm not sure what's gonna happen with those few boxes there, but I will be hosting a kickoff on March 16th. I haven't set the time yet. It's probably gonna be at the middle school. Those details will come later, but I just wanted you to know if you are interested in learning to monitor any bluebird trail or want to get involved with monitoring the bluebird trails that um, that we do at the high school or maybe through the bird club, if you wanna learn about that, we will just go over, we'll, we'll be at a box, we'll talk about how to monitor bluebirds, what the proper protocols are, what you're looking for, and talk about NestWatch. And NestWatch is the data manager that we're using through Cornell. And um, they're the same people that do eBird. 
And it's a, this will be the third year we're using Nest Watch. And each year we've gotten refined a little bit, uh, using it a little bit better, but there are always a few glitches and people can, you know, I, I would like to just remind people of some of the things that have not gone right in the past. Uh, and then we'll repair, check the boxes and repair them if necessary, make sure they're all cleaned. Um, and orient any new people to where the trail actually is, where the boxes are. Uh, usually it takes maybe two, three hours at the most. We spend about an hour at the box talking about monitoring and going over nest watch, and then we go out on the trail. Um, so look, keep an eye out for that, for more information on that. And this year I'm really hoping there's someone who would like to volunteer to maybe four times during the summer, go out with a weed whacker and weed whack around the boxes. Uh, Cause we've really had a problem managing the, the weeds. So I, I did it twice last summer, but it wasn't enough. Um, so I'm hoping th that there's someone who may be not be interested in doing the monitoring, but may want to go out with the weed whacker. So that's it for me, um, unless there are any questions. And if there are, put them in the chat and I'll be watching. And um, Judy, if you want to talk about vernal pools and frog watch, I know it's getting late. <laughs> okay. Um, one of my passions as a master naturalist has been monitoring vernal pools. And I, of course, monitor the, the four pools that are at Claytor Lake State Park and also help Bruce Grimes with his pool sometimes at uh, Fenwick Mines. But if you're interested in vernal pool monitoring, we have a, a training session coming up on January 25th at 7 p.m. It's going to be Zoom. Um, there'll be a sign up on the calendar for that. There's the training session, which is a couple hours. And then you have to do a field session. And I've got field sessions set up and you can do one or all three or whatever um, you want to do. But the field trips that I have set up for, for vernal pool monitoring this year, the first one is January 28th, which is right after the training session. And that one is at noon at Claytor Lake State Park. And if you're interested, the bird club is doing um, the Claytor Lake State Park. We go out and look for winter waterfowl at two o'clock. That's why I chose that day. And that's going to be an early field trip. The other two field trips will be February 10th and February 24th. I try to go out about every two weeks and monitor my pools. Um, and those will both be at 2 PM. Plan on an hour to an hour and a half for the, for the monitoring training thing, the um, field trip part. And we went out and checked the pools yesterday. And I have marbled salamander larvae in in the bent tree pool. So we're really excited that when we were out there right before Christmas, there was no water in that pool. It was dry. We were walking around trying to find <coughs> mama marbled salamanders with eggs that we could take pictures of and, and document, but we couldn't find any, of course. But anyway, um, with the rain that we've had and now with the snow, it looks like we're going to actually have a, a vernal pool season. The other thing that I do mostly out at Porter Lake State Park is, um, well, I do a lot of stuff. But anyway, the other project, citizen science project that we do is called Frog Watch. And Brenda Graff is the trainer for both of these, uh, the, in, the Zoom trainer, and then I'm the field trip person. And we don't have that set up yet, but basically there's a protocol. It's now administered by um, Akron Zoo, but there's a protocol. You go out in the woods or go out to where your frogs are half an hour after sunset. And you take about five minutes to listen to the frogs and identify them and send that data in. And there's just something magical about going out in the dark and listening and it's really cool when you know what you hear out there, the frogs and such. So if anybody's interested in that, just watch the calendar and we'll get the training session going for that one too. So if anybody got okay. any questions, you can contact me. 
or Thank Brenda. You. Thank you. Uh, the only two things I want to cover very quickly, you probably got an email about it. Uh, we have some uh, training that we are required to do. Uh, it's the risk management um, webinar that's on the Virginia Master Naturalist website and also the civil rights. Uh, we have to continue, we have to complete both of those modules. I think the only people that don't have to do it. Uh oh. Their training. So be sure to finish that up. It's online. It's pretty easy to cover. Uh, just go to the Virginia Master Naturalist website and get it done and log your out. And hey. I'd like to, I'd like to add one more thing because Carol uh, Kaufman's not here. And our next chapter meeting will be a training for living with urban bears, which the DWR is sponsoring. So it, the next chapter meeting will be a, a video that they show to help us where we can set up a, a, an information site or be able to talk with our citizens, our fellow citizens about how to live with urban bear. That will be on the next chapter meeting, which is hmm, Monday, September, I mean, February um, 18th, I think. And then, right. uh, and then there, right. will be, there will be an individual training for people who know they want to be involved, either at, uh, at, at in the educational sense where you'll man a table and be available for questions and passing out information, or um, or to actually just be interested in doing that in in ways of where you're just going to be around for answering questions on um, February 28th, right, Judy, at um, at the Water's Edge of uh, Conference Center mm. at at Claytor Lake. And that will be, I, you know, I didn't, I, I've asked, but I haven't heard. Is it going to be an evening or an afternoon meeting? Oh, I don't think we figured that part out yet. Okay, well, it's come, <laughs> it's it's coming up, and so if you are interested, yeah, the calendar. In, yeah, it, it's on the calendar. The details for that are still being ironed out, but for all of us to watch. Uh, what the DWR is presenting as far as the way to manage uh, the way we deal with urban bear. Thank yeah. you everybody for your patience. I know we ran over. I appreciate uh, the people that stayed for staying and have a great month and log your hours. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.